In late January of 1959, a group of nine adventurers led by a man named Igor Dyatlov set off for a planned 16-day cross-country ski trip, which would see their expedition move across a mountain range that splits Western Russia from Siberia. Sadly, no one would return. During the night of February the 1st, all party members were killed under truly bizarre circumstances. Once rescuers arrived, they were met with a grim scene and a series of obscure clues. The problem was that none of the clues correlated with each other. The strange evidence that remained on the mountaintop would fuel one of the most interesting mysteries of all time. A devastating and mysterious force of nature, or an epic government cover-up. Join us as we share this incredible story. Welcome to Mysteries Retold. The Dyatlov Pass incident is one of the most fascinating unsolved mysteries from the last century. The details of this cursed expedition are incredibly strange, prompting a huge range of theory and explanation. In February 1959, a group of nine experienced and expert Russian mountaineers perished during a difficult expedition in the northern Urals. Investigators and enthusiasts alike have struggled to piece together all the events from that night, and despite many theories there is still a shroud of mystery over the cause of death. After setting up their tent on the mountain in difficult conditions on that cold and tragic February night, something happened during the night that caused the group to cut their way out of their tent, strangely from the inside out. The group of nine then scarpered off in different directions. It was presumed this was done under urgency as it was discovered the group were not wearing the clothing you would expect in the sub-zero temperatures once their bodies were found. Eventually, after a difficult search and rescue operation, the bodies were found in the midst of a chaotic scene. It was first determined that six of the nine had died of hypothermia, while the other three had died of physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of these four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face. Two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. Some of them were barely wearing any clothing at all. The nine were found under such a range of circumstances, with differing injuries it made pulling together a cohesive order of events very difficult. Evidence of radiation was found on one of the man's items of clothing, which prompted wilder theory surrounding accidentally stumbling upon a secret government weapons testing range, whilst others even claimed UFO activity. Be it nature or not, there is compelling evidence of a cover-up. Initially, the investigation could only conclude a vague description of a compelling natural force had caused the deaths. Let's break this down from the beginning. Firstly, it is known that the group arrived by train at Ivdel. This is a town at the center of the northern province of Sverdlovsk Oblast in the early morning hours of January 25, 1959. They then took a truck to Vijay, which is a lorry village that is the last inhabited settlement to the north. While spending the night in Vijay, the skiers purchased and ate loaves of bread to keep their energy levels up for the following day's hike. On January 27th, they then began their trek toward Gora Ototen. Just one day later, on January 28th, one member, Yuri Yudin, who had several health ailments, including rheumatism and a congenital heart defect, turned back due to knee and joint pain that made him unable to continue the hike. The remaining nine hikers continued the trek. Diaries and cameras found around their last campsite made it possible to track the group's route up to the day preceding the devastating incident. On the 31st of January, the group arrived at the edge of a highland area and began to prepare for climbing the mountain upward. In a wooded valley, they cached surplus food and equipment that would be used for the trip back. The next day the hikers started to move through the pass. It seems they planned to get over the pass and make camp for the next night on the opposite side, but because of worsening weather conditions including snowstorms and decreasing visibility, they lost their direction and deviated west. When they realized their mistake, the group decided to set up camp right there on the slope of the mountain, rather than move 1.5 kilometers downhill to a forested area that would have offered some shelter from the weather. It was speculated that they probably did not want to lose the altitude they had gained. Before leaving, Dyatlov, the group leader, had agreed he would send a telegram to their sports club as soon as the group returned to Vijay. It was expected that this would happen no later than the 12th of February, but Dyatlov had told Yudin, before he departed from the group, 
that he expected it to be longer. When the twelfth passed, and no messages had been received, there was no immediate reaction, as delays of a few days were common with such expeditions. On the 20th of February, the travellers' relatives demanded a rescue operation, and the head of the institute sent the first rescue groups, consisting of volunteer students and teachers. Later, the army and police forces became involved, with planes and helicopters ordered to join the operation. On the 26th of February, the rescuers found the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent. The campsite baffled the search party. Mikhail Sharavin, the student who found the tent, said, the tent was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty, and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Leading on from the cut tent, nine sets of footprints, left by people wearing only socks, a single shoe or even bare feet, could be followed, leading down to the edge of a nearby wood on the opposite side of the pass, 1.5 kilometers to the northeast. After 500 meters, these tracks were covered with snow. At the forest's edge, under a large Siberian pine, the searchers found the visible remains of a small fire. There they found the first two bodies, shoeless and dressed only in underwear. The branches on the tree were broken up to five meters high, suggesting that one of the skiers had climbed up to look for something, perhaps the location of the camp, or perhaps he was actually trying to escape from something. Between the pine and the camp, the searchers found three more corpses, including Dietlov who died in positions suggesting that they were attempting to return to the tent. They were found at distances of 300, 480, and 630 meters from the tree. Finding the remaining four travelers took more than two months. They were finally found on the 4th of May, under four meters of snow in a ravine, 75 meters further into the woods from the pine tree. Three of the four were better dressed than the others, and there were signs that some clothing of those who had died first had been removed for use by the others. Dubinina, the only woman in the group, was wearing one of the others' torn trousers, which had also been burned, and her left foot and shin were wrapped in a torn jacket. As mentioned at first, the investigation concluded that a compelling natural force had caused the deaths. Numerous theories have been put forward to account for the unexplained deaths. These include, but are not limited to, animal attacks, hypothermia, an avalanche, catabatic winds, a romantic dispute, infrasound-induced panic, military involvement, nuclear weapons testing, UFOs, yeti attacks or something else paranormal. Strangely, there is evidence for all of these events as well as a government cover-up. We know that three of the hikers had fatal injuries with major skull damage and chest fractures, however, it is reported that the bodies had no external cuts or injuries. This indicates that the bodies could have been crushed or hit under high pressure. To sustain such devastating injuries, they would have been hit very hard with evidence showing it would have to be a similar force to a car crash. All four bodies found at the bottom of the creek in a running stream of water had soft tissue damage to their head and face. One was missing her tongue, eyes, part of the lips, as well as facial tissue and a fragment of skull bone, while another had his eyeballs missing. The forensic expert performing the post-mortem examination judged that these injuries happened post-mortem due to the location of the bodies in a stream. Perhaps animals had been picking at the bodies after death, although some say something else could have been at play. There was initial speculation that the indigenous Mansi people, reindeer herders local to the area, had attacked and murdered the group for encroaching upon their lands. Several Mansi were interrogated, but the investigation indicated that the nature of the deaths did not support this hypothesis. Only the hikers' footprints were visible, and they showed no sign of hand-to-hand -hand struggle. So let us summarize the details that we know. Six of the group members died of hypothermia and three of fatal injuries. There were no indications of other people nearby apart from the nine travelers. The tent had been ripped open from within. The victims had died six to eight hours after their last meal. Traces from the camp showed that all group members left the campsite of their own accord, on foot. Some levels of radiation were found on one victim's clothing. To dispel the theory of an attack by the indigenous Mansi people, it was stated that the fatal injuries of the three bodies could not have been caused by human beings, because the force of the blows had been too strong and no soft tissue had been damaged. Released documents contained no information about the condition of the skier's internal organs. It was also discovered 
that when Dyatlov's body was found he had a bit of flesh in his mouth. He had bitten it off his own hand. Some of the bodies had third-degree burns on their hands and legs. At the time, the official conclusion was that the group members had died because of a compelling natural force. The inquest officially ceased in May 1959 as a result of the absence of a guilty party. The original files of the investigation were sent to a secret archive. These files were mysteriously never seen again. So what really happened, and what was the so-called compelling natural force? Well, on July 11, 2020, it was announced that an avalanche would be the official cause of death for the group. It's said that this avalanche was the catalyst for events that followed. Later independent computer simulation and analysis by Swiss researchers also suggested avalanche as the cause. It was supposedly a rare type of avalanche, called a slab avalanche. This is where a slab of snow quickly slips from one level to another and would have been prompted by the way the tent was set up. We can liken the action to holding two books, one on top of the other. Imagine then tilting these books downwards. Eventually, at a certain angle, the top book would slip. The theory is that when the party cut into the snow to set up their tent, they loosened the top slab, which in time would set off the awful event. Summarizing the report in The New Yorker, Douglas Preston writes, The most appealing aspect of the scenario is that the Dyatlov party's actions no longer seem irrational. The snow slab, according to Green, would probably have made loud cracks and rumbles as it fell across the tent, making an avalanche seem imminent. It was noted that although the skiers made an error in the placement of their tent, everything they did subsequently was textbook. They conducted an emergency evacuation to ground that would be safe from an avalanche, they took shelter in the woods, they started a fire, they dug a snow cave. Had they been less experienced, they might have remained near the tent, dug it out, and survived. But avalanches are by far the biggest risk in the mountains in winter, and the more experience you have, the more you fear them. The skiers' expertise doomed them. So some of the events start to sound more plausible. Again, another report seems to back this theory up, reviewing a sensationalist Yeti hypothesis. American skeptic author Benjamin Radford suggests an avalanche as more plausible. He writes that the group woke up in a panic and cut their way out the tent, either because an avalanche had covered the entrance to their tent or because they were scared that an avalanche was imminent. Better to have a potentially repairable slit in a tent than risk being buried alive in it under tons of snow. They were poorly clothed because they had been sleeping and ran to the safety of the nearby woods where trees would help slow oncoming snow. In the darkness of night, they got separated into two or three groups. One group made a fire, hence the burned hands and legs, while the others tried to return to the tent to recover their clothing since the danger had passed. But it was too cold and they all froze to death before they could locate their tent in the darkness. At some point, some of the clothes may have been recovered or swapped from the dead, but at any rate, the group of four whose bodies was most severely damaged were caught in an avalanche and buried under four meters of snow, which is more than enough to account for the compelling natural force the medical examiner described. Dubinina's tongue and the other body parts missing from party members were likely removed by scavengers and ordinary predation. This scenario certainly could account for some of the detail. We could even theorize that the tree had been climbed to collect dry wood from the top for the fire. As the group fell into hypothermia, they couldn't feel anything, including the fire starting to badly burn them. We could even theorize that the chunk of flesh that Dyatlov bit off his own arm was because he was testing if he had lost all sensation. On the surface, this sounds like a logical assessment, However, there are still many contrasting arguments against the avalanche theory. Some of these arguments include the following. The location of the incident did not have any obvious signs of an avalanche having taken place. An avalanche would have left certain patterns and debris distributed over a wide area. The bodies found within a month of the event were covered with a very shallow layer of snow, and had there been an avalanche of sufficient strength to sweep away the second party, these bodies would have been swept away as well. This would have caused more serious and different injuries in the process and would have damaged the tree line. Over 100 expeditions to the region had been held since the incident and none of them ever reported conditions that might create an avalanche. A study of the area using up-to-date terrain-related physics revealed that the location was entirely unlikely for such an avalanche to have occurred. 
the dangerous conditions found in another nearby area, which had significantly steeper slopes and cornices, were observed in April and May when the snowfalls of winter were melting. During February, when the incident occurred, there were no such conditions. An analysis of the terrain and the slope showed that even if there could have been a very specific avalanche that found its way into the area, its path would have gone past the tent. The tent had collapsed from the side but not in a horizontal direction. Dyatlov was an experienced skier, and the much older Zolotaryov was studying for his master's certificate in ski instruction and mountain hiking. Neither of these two men would have been likely to camp anywhere in the path of a potential avalanche. Footprint patterns leading away from the tent were inconsistent with someone, let alone a group of nine people, running in panic from either real or imagined danger. All the footprints leading away from the tent and towards the woods were consistent with individuals who were walking at a normal pace. So despite the avalanche theory in many circles sounding plausible, there is significant evidence that it didn't happen. Which again begs the question, what was the compelling natural force? Well, another theory points to a catabatic wind. In 2019, a Swedish-Russian expedition was made to the site, and after investigations they proposed that a violent catabatic wind was a plausible explanation for the incident. Catabatic winds are somewhat rare events and can be extremely violent. They were implicated in a 1978 case at Anaris Mountain in Sweden, where eight hikers were killed and one was severely injured. The topography of these locations was noted to be very similar according to the expedition. A sudden catabatic wind would have made it impossible to remain in the tent, and the most rational course of action would have been for the hikers to cover the tent with snow and seek shelter behind the tree line. On top of the tent, there was also a flashlight left turned on, possibly left there intentionally, so that the hikers could find their way back to the tent once the wind subsided. The expedition proposed that the group of hikers constructed two bivouac shelters, one of which collapsed, leaving four of the hikers buried with the severe injuries observed. Again, in isolation, the theory sounds plausible, but why then the lack of clothing? Would the hikers really have had to cut the tent from the inside? It seems of all theories presented, only some details can be accounted for. A third theory involves something called infrasound. It was a hypothesis popularized by Donny Icar's 2013 book Dead Mountain, which states that wind going around Kolatsyakl created a calm and vortex street, which can produce infrasound capable of inducing panic attacks in humans. According to Icar's theory, the infrasound generated by the wind as it passed over the top of the Holochal mountain was responsible for causing physical discomfort and mental distress in the hikers. Icar claims that because of their panic, the hikers were driven to leave the tent by whatever means necessary and fled down the slope. By the time they were further down the hill, they would have been out of the infrasound's path and would have regained their composure, but in the darkness would have been unable to return to their shelter. The traumatic injuries suffered by three of the victims were the result of their stumbling over the edge of a ravine in the darkness and landing on the rocks at the bottom. Again, this theory might account for some of the behaviours but as mentioned, the bodies didn't have severe external damage akin to a long fall. And why would they be so lost? In further speculation, some experts theorized the campsite fell within the path of a Soviet parachute mine exercise. This theory alleges that the hikers, woken by loud explosions, fled the tent in a shoeless panic and found themselves unable to return for supply retrieval. After some members froze to death attempting to endure the bombardment, Others commandeered their clothing only to be fatally injured by subsequent parachute mine concussions. There are indeed records of parachute mines being tested by the Soviet military in the area around the time the hikers were there. Parachute mines detonate while still in the air, rather than upon striking the Earth's surface, and produce signature injuries similar to those experienced by the hikers. Heavy internal damage with relatively little external trauma. The theory coincides with reported sightings of glowing orange orbs floating or falling in the sky within the general vicinity of the hikers and allegedly photographed by them, potentially military aircraft or descending parachute mines. This theory, among others, uses scavenging animals to explain Dubinina's injuries. Some speculate that the bodies were unnaturally manipulated on the basis of characteristic liver mortis markings discovered during an autopsy as well as burns to hair and skin. 
Photographs of the tent allegedly show that it was erected incorrectly, something the experienced hikers were unlikely to have done. A similar theory alleges the testing of radiological weapons, and is based partly on the discovery of radioactivity on some of the clothing, as well as the descriptions of the bodies by relatives as having orange skin and grey hair. However, radioactive dispersal would have affected all, not just some of the hikers and equipment, and the skin and hair discoloration can be explained by a natural process of mummification after three months of exposure to the cold and wind. The initial suppression by Soviet authorities of files describing the group's disappearance is sometimes mentioned as evidence of a cover-up, but the concealment of information about domestic incidents was standard procedure in the USSR, and thus far from peculiar. Again it feels like some evidence fits, while some doesn't. Paradoxical undressing was also presented as a theory. International Science Times posited that the hikers' deaths were caused by hypothermia, which can induce a behavior known as paradoxical undressing, in which hypothermic subjects remove their clothes in response to perceived feelings of burning warmth. It is undisputed that six of the nine hikers died of hypothermia. However, others in the group appear to have acquired additional clothing from those who had already died which suggests that they were of a sound enough mind to try to add layers. Why was there such a range of different behaviours on show from the highly skilled and experienced group? What on earth really happened on the mountain? Someone named Keith McCloskey, who has researched the incident for many years and has appeared in several TV documentaries on the subject, travelled to the Dyatlov Pass in 2015 with Yuri Kuntsevich of the Dyatlov Foundation and a group. At the Dyatlov Pass he noted there were wide discrepancies in distances quoted between the two possible locations of the snow shelter where the first four bodies were found. One location was approximately 80 to 100 meters from the pine tree where the bodies of Doroshenko and Krivonyshenko were found, and the other suggested location was so close to the tree that anyone in the snow shelter could have spoken to those at the tree without raising their voices to be heard. This second location also has a rock in the stream where Dubinina's body was found and is the more likely location of the two. However, the second suggested location of the two has a topography that is closer to the photos taken at the time of the search in 1959. The location of the tent near the ridge was found to be too close to the spur of the ridge for any significant build-up of snow to cause an avalanche. Furthermore, the prevailing wind blowing over the ridge had the effect of blowing snow away from the edge of the ridge on the side where the tent was. This further reduced any build-up of snow to cause an avalanche. This aspect of the lack of snow on the top and near the top of the ridge was pointed out by Sergei Sogrin in 2010. McCloskey also noted, Lev Ivanov's boss, Evgeny Okishev, deputy head of the investigative department of the Sverdlovsk Oblast Prosecution Office, was still alive in 2015 and had given an interview to former Kemerovo prosecutor Leonid Proshkin, in which Okishev stated that he was arranging another trip to the pass to fully investigate the strange deaths of the last four bodies when Deputy Prosecutor General Urakov arrived from Moscow and ordered the case shut down. Evgeny Okishev also stated in his interview with Leonid Proshkin that Klinov, head of the Sverdlovsk prosecutor's office, was present at the first post-mortems in the morgue and spent three days there something Okishev regarded as highly unusual and the only time in his experience it had happened. Again we ask ourselves, what on earth happened up there on the mountain? Strangely, there is proof of orange orbs and strange lights in the sky within this area. This has led many people to believe that the adventurers encountered something military and classified. Numerous compelling arguments support this perspective, with one of the most compelling being the commencement of the government investigation on February 6th. This initiation occurred well before the tourists were expected to return home, preempting any concerns from their relatives. Astonishingly, the inquiry was swiftly classified and terminated. Signs point to a meticulously orchestrated scene by the KGB and or military designed to confound ordinary investigators. Disturbingly, bodies were repositioned post-mortem, displaying postures inconsistent with the moment of death as confirmed by pathologists. Some bodies were inadequately covered with snow, despite allegedly enduring weeks on a windy, snowy mountain, evident footprints and all. Clothing had been treated with specialized reagents, resulting in a peculiar blue-violet hue, and deliberately mixed among the deceased. Cameras lacked films, 
diaries were missing, yet valuables remained untouched. Notably, three individuals sustained severe injuries, such as broken ribs and skulls. Local indigenous people, the Mansi, claimed to witness soldiers following the tourists' trail a mere two days after their passing. The government proposed on-site burials to obfuscate the body's condition, but vehement objections from parents thwarted this plan. The mysterious encounter that attracted soldiers may have involved a falling missile, supported by numerous indicators. Reports from observers in the region, including the Mansi, described glowing spheres in the sky, a phenomenon unfamiliar in 1959. The peculiar orange-brown skin of the corpses aligns with exposure to unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, a primary missile fuel component. Radiation traces on clothing suggest the missile carried a nuclear warhead. Delving further into the group dynamics, all members of the Dyatlov's group were students, except for Semen Zolotarev, an enigmatic addition just three days before departure. Unbeknownst to others, he was a war hero who fought in Berlin in 1945, raising suspicions of espionage. Zolotarev's corpse, found with a camera but lacking film, sparks speculation about whether he intentionally led the students to a covert military facility. I guess we will never truly know all of the details that led to the awful incident. As interesting as this mystery is, first and foremost, our deepest condolences lie with the individuals involved and their families. What do you think happened to the group, and why is the evidence so inconsistent? Was it really a terrible, naturally caused accident, or could it have been a cover-up? Do you really believe that it's possible something paranormal happened on that tragic night? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching Mysteries Retold. If you have enjoyed today's content, please give the video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to hear all our future stories. Sleep tight, and remember, sometimes not all is as it seems. Stay curious and good night.